The ancient Romans knew how prisms could produce a rainbow of colors, but it wasn't until Isaac Newton in 1666 actually determined why. Up until that time, people thought that prisms actually created the colors, but Newton was able to prove that all of those colors were already present in light and that the prism was simply separating them. In 1860, um, Bunsen and Kirchhoff created the first modern spectroscope. Basically what it did is it, it used a prism. As you can see, there is a prism in the center of this device. So they would heat a sample of an element in a flame, the light would pass through a prism, and then it would separate the colors produced by that particular element. It turned out that each element had a very specific series of colors. So it was like almost like a fingerprint. Each of these elements has a very specific array of colored lines of light. Now at that time, scientists had no idea why elements produced only very particular colors, and they had no idea why they produced colors at all. Remember back in those days, in 1860, they knew that atoms existed, but at that time they still thought atoms were simply indivisible balls. They had no idea about the structure of atoms, that they contained electrons, protons, and neutrons. Now, an interesting thing one can do, because each of these elements has a very specific array of colors, you can use spectroscopes to identify unknown samples. For example, let's suppose we had a sample of water and we heated it up in a flame, and we passed the light through a prism and found that these particular lines of light were formed, we can take a look at these known samples and very quickly deduce that, ah, there must be lithium in this particular sample. So it's a very useful tool for identifying elements in unknown samples. Another really important use of spectroscopy was to discover new elements. As soon as Bunsen and Kirchhoff created their spectroscope, they used it to discover some new elements. They looked at samples and if they found lines of color that did not match um, elements that were known at the time, they knew they'd found a new element. So in 1860, the same year that they produced their spectroscope, they discovered cesium, and a year later, rubidium. Other chemists also used the spectroscope, and they discovered thallium in 1861 and indium in 1863. Now, one element I left off that list, I did for a reason. That's because it's the only element in the history of chemistry that was not first discovered on Earth. What do you suppose that element was? Well, let me give you a hint. And the answer, of course, is helium. Helium was discovered in 1868, but it wasn't actually isolated until 30 years later. So where did they discover helium? Answer is in the sun. They looked at light coming from the sun, passed it through their spectroscope, and they found some lines that didn't correspond to any known element that had been discovered as yet. And so they named it helium after the Greek word for the sun, which is helios. And then 30 years later, chemists actually found helium on Earth, and when they took the spectrum of this new element, they realized, ah, it was the same as this element that had been discovered in the sun via the spectroscope 30 years earlier. Now, it wasn't until the 20th century that chemists began to understand where these colors of light were coming from. Niels Bohr, in 1913, came up with what's commonly called the planetary model of the atom, where he envisioned a nucleus at the center of the atom and then the electrons just sort of orbiting around the nucleus. The electrons, of course, because they have an opposite charge of the protons, they want to be as close to the nucleus as they can be, and we refer to that as the ground state. If you put energy into an atom, you can do it by heating it 
by hitting it with electromagnetic radiation or by using electricity, you can cause an electron to jump to a higher level. And that electron, of course, will then fall back down. It's no different than if you toss a ball in the air, the ball is immediately going to fall back down. Now, when an electron falls from its excited state back to its ground state, it always emits a photon of electromagnetic radiation. Often, those photons are found in the visible spectrum. Very commonly, if electrons fall from a higher level down to the second energy level in an atom, that amount of energy just happens to correspond to various colors of light. If electrons fall further, if they were to fall all the way down to the first energy level, that energy is much greater, and those photons usually fall in the ultraviolet range, so we don't see those. If the electrons perhaps only fell down to the third level, then we might have infrared radiation. And so that you can get photons of all the different kinds of electromagnetic radiation, but of course, for us, visible light is the most important because it's the one that we can see. Now, these days, we have much more modern spectroscopes than Bunsen and Kirchhoff had. These modern devices, you can inject a sample of an unknown material into this machine. It will heat it up and excite all of the various atoms. Each of those atoms will emit various photons, and the, all of those photons of light are separated by a prism-like device. A computer analyzes and measures the wavelengths of each of those photons, and then it matches it up with a database of all known elements and can very quickly tell you which elements you have. You might be able to analyze 70 different elements simultaneously, in fact, it's even possible to determine how much of the element is there by simply looking at how bright or how intense the various lines of light are. Good morning, everybody. Um, today we're going to be doing experiment number six, which is identifying elements by the colors they emit when they're heated up in a flame. So we're going to be investigating six different elements. We've got sodium, potassium, calcium, strontium, barium, and copper. Each of those elements, when they're heated in a flame, causes the electrons to be excited. And of course, like we talked about in class, when the electrons fall back down to their ground state, they emit various colors of light. And I've chosen these six elements because they give pretty distinctive colors, which we'll find out in a little bit. So the lab is, is pretty straightforward. We're going to be heating up samples of each of these elements in a Bunsen burner. And to do that, we're going to be using a metal rod. So we have these glass rods with a little metal tip on them. We're simply going to dip the metal tip into a solution of the uh, element, put it in the Bunsen burner flame, and then observe the colors that appear. Now, in the past, we have used what's called nichrome wire. It's made of nickel and chromium. The advantage is it's cheap. It's very inexpensive. The problem is nichrome wire tends to give off some of its own color. It, it produces sort of an orange color, and I'll illustrate that for you in a couple of minutes. Recently, I've been able to obtain some platinum wire. Now, platinum is very expensive, so we're quite uh, careful about this, but platinum is a very inert metal, and as you'll see in a few minutes, when you heat platinum wire in a flame, it doesn't produce any color. So the nichrome wire sometimes tends to interfere with our observations of the various elements. The other advantage of, of the uh, platinum wire is it's easy to clean. With nichrome wire, we have to dip it in concentrated hydrochloric acid, which we would rather not do, but with the platinum wire, we can simply dip it into a beaker of water. So water cleans it off very nicely. So we're going to be testing each of these six different elements and then recording observations. You guys will, of course, have the videos that I'm going to make. And then we're going to be testing unknowns. So I have a container here of various unknowns. Each of these unknowns has to be one of those six elements. So I'll be 
testing some of these unknowns, and then what you'll do is you will compare the observations of the unknown when it's heated in the flame, and it should match what you see with one of those six knowns. So it's a, it's a rather simple version of, of techniques that chemists use in laboratories all the time. We have devices down in our instrument lab that do this same thing. They heat up a sample of elements in a flame, the various colors are emitted, and it, the colors are separated by their wavelength, and then the wavelengths allow us to identify the element. We're going to do a simpler version of this. We're not going to try to separate the colors of each element into each individual wavelength of light. We're just going to look at the overall color and use that as an identification. All right, well, let's go ahead over to the lab and get to work. Now before we get started, I did tell you that I would show you the difference between nichrome and platinum wire. So let's take a look first at the nichrome. As you can see, nichrome wire tends to give off quite a bright orange light, and this can tend to interfere with some of our samples, especially those that are orange. Now let's take a look at the platinum wire. The platinum wire gives off only a small amount of orange light, and so that's usually not enough to interfere with our results. So platinum is expensive, but it's worth it because it gives us much better results. Let's begin with sodium. We have a solution of sodium chloride. We'll put a drop of that on the tip of our metal rod and then put it into the flame. And you can see the sodium has a very intense sort of yellow-orange color. That intensity can be very useful in identifying it. Here's another drop, and again, very, very bright. They actually use sodium in some of those overhead street lights that gives that very bright, gaudy yellow color that you sometimes see in parking lots. All right, let's make sure our wire is clean. And it looks fairly colorless, so we must have gotten the sodium off. So let's go ahead and test a sample of calcium. You'll notice that the calcium is not quite as intense as sodium. It's a more of a deeper orange color. It's still got some yellow, but it is more orange. And it's not quite as intense as the sodium. So these two are fairly similar to one another. So if you have sodium or calcium as your unknowns, you have to be real careful. Let's take a look at one more sample of this. Again, you can see much more orange, even a little reddish with the calcium, and not quite so bright as the sodium is. Now let's take a look at potassium. Potassium gives sort of a lovely violet or lavender color, as most people like to describe it. Let's take a look at that again. Notice it's much fainter than sodium, but it has that very nice, mild violet color. There, one more time. So potassium is pretty easy to recognize. It's the only element we'll be testing that has that violet color, and it's also fairly faint. Now, let's make sure we have the wire clean for our next test. So we'll put it back in the flame after rinsing it off, and we can see there's virtually no color. So it looks like we are good to go. Next, let's take a look at barium. You'll notice that barium gives sort of a yellowish and then turns to green, so it's also pretty distinctive. Let's go ahead and take a look at another drop. Again, after a bit, it turns into that nice green color, so it's pretty easy to identify. Now let's take a look at strontium. Strontium has a really nice, intense red color. You give it a moment, you can see it's a very deep red, much more so than calcium. They actually use strontium in fireworks. Anytime you want to have a nice red in fireworks, strontium is what they're using. For the blues, they use copper. For yellows, sodium. So these elements have some very practical uses. 
Again, you can see a very nice deep red color, so it's pretty easy to tell strontium apart from calcium. And finally, let's take a look at copper. Copper gives a very pretty sort of greenish blue color. Very characteristic. Let's take a look at another sample. So copper is pretty easy to recognize. That lovely intense blue-green color almost gives us a rainbow of colors. All right, let's test a few of these unknowns now. We'll start out with unknown number 18 and see if you can figure out what it is. Okay, it's got a pretty nice bright yellow color. Let's take a look at that again. And we'll do one more sample here. Good look at this. And then you can go back and take a look at the samples we tested earlier and for comparison and see if you can figure out the identity of unknown number 18. All right, next up, let's take a look at unknown number 10. All right, that's got sort of a pale yellowish green color. I think you'll be able to figure out which one that is. Our next sample will be unknown number 14. All right, that's a lovely color. All right, again, that's unknown number 14. Now let's take a look at unknown number 16. It's a very nice color. Let's try that one again. And one more time just so you get a really good look. And again that was unknown number 16. This is unknown number 15. Let's take a look at that one again. And just one more time. And this will be unknown number five. That's a very distinctive color. Let's see that one again. And just one more time. All right, let's finish up with unknown number 21. It's a pretty impressive color. Okay, just do it one more time. And that's unknown number 21. All right, now that we've finished testing all of our known samples, 
and we did seven unknowns, your job is going to be to identify those unknowns. Now, one thing that students often ask me, and they get very nervous, is they will test two unknowns, and it, they look the same. And they say, wow, is it possible that I could have two unknowns that are the same? The answer is absolutely, because there are only six choices for your known sample, which means there can only be six different unknowns. This box here has 21 bottles in it, so clearly there are multiple bottles of each unknown, so certainly you could get the same one. I did that purposely in these tests for our online lab, so you will find that of those seven unknowns, of course, there has to at least be two that are the same, because there's only six different possibilities, so you'll have to look, look really carefully when you analyze those. So I'll let you know how many unknowns I want you to identify and which ones those will be when we do the lab. Now that we've finished the experimental part of the lab, I think it's time we should have some fun. So I'm going to do a, a demonstration that we, that we often do for our um, National Chemistry Week chemistry show, and we're going to make chemical flares with each of these six compounds. It's going to illustrate how we use these chemicals in fireworks. So each of those uh, six metal crucibles there are filled with some potassium chlorate and sugar. Potassium chlorate is our source of oxygen and the sugar provides the fuel. So we're going to ignite those two things by adding some sulfuric acid and then to each of those six crucibles I've added a few grams of one of those six test compounds that we used in the lab. So let's see how the colors look in these chemical flares. This is strontium. This is potassium. This is sodium. This is barium. 
this is calcium. And finally, copper.